for us. And I just pray, Lord, that we would continue to keep our focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in week two of our series, This Christmas I Want to Learn How to. And today's topic is resist temptation. Last week we learned about how to manage our anger, so hopefully many of you have been managing your anger this past week. And uh, like last week, how we said that anger is not a sin, well, temptation is not a sin as well. But the idea here is we want to resist temptation because it will send us down a path of sin. So temptation is not a sin, but giving in to the temptation can lead us to sin. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a question, and we're going to ask this. Where does temptation come from? Where does temptation come from? Now, this Puritan, his name is Thomas Brooks, he wrote this book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. Now, what you have to learn about Puritans is they write really long books and they have really long titles. So, the, basically, the concise message is based upon the scriptures, but he talks about where temptation actually comes from. And he boils it down to the scriptures teach three areas. And the first area is the world. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. The things of this world, the culture, the godless ideas, the godless attitudes, the more we allow the things of this world into our lives, the more susceptible we are to believing what the world believes and acting like the world acts. Now, here's where it gets tricky. It gets tricky because our minds are so conformed. The rest of this passage actually says, but be transformed by renewing your mind. So, so this gets tricky because our minds are so conformed to what the world has to offer. We start to think and we start to act like the world. And here's what happens. Temptation comes our way. We don't even recognize it because the thing that we're tempted to do is what God calls sin, but the world does not call sin. So our minds are so confused, we go into this area of sin that we don't even recognize actually is a sin. Now the next area of temptation, or where temptation comes from, excuse me, is from the devil. Now, if you're new here and some of you walk in, you're like, oh, they're talking about the devil. That's weird. Well, the truth is the devil, Satan and his demons are spoke about in the scriptures extensively. We know that when Jesus, before he actually uh, started his ministry and went to the cross, the devil deceived him. Or the devil was trying to deceive him, trying to tempt him. The devil deceived Eve way back in Genesis, but then the devil tries to tempt Jesus to actually sin. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says to believers, believers, he says, for fear that the tempter may have tempted you. He's talking about de the devil. See, this is part of spiritual warfare. Last week, if you were here, you might remember I said, the devil has no control over your salvation. When you believe in Christ as your Savior, you're saved. You're accepted by God because you have allowed him to forgive you of your sins. The devil can't do anything about that, can't take that away. But the devil can actually tempt you to sin so that you're displeasing to God and make a mess of things. You know, some people might have heard this when somebody, you know, prominent maybe sins. They say, the devil made me do it. Have you ever heard that before? The devil can't make you do anything, okay? But what the devil will do is he'll try to tempt you by using the things of this world and what we're going to talk about next by, by actually tempting you for your fleshly desires. So the devil, here's what he's doing. He's in the business of taking something that is or something that can be good, uses it to trap us to make us a slave to it. So he uses the thing of this wor things of this world and often the times the things of God that God has called good to tempt us to do sinful things. And we're going to get more into that. Here's one of the ways he does it, though. He appeals to the last area. Where does temptation come from? And that is the flesh. James 13, or excuse me, 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say that when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, 
brings forth death. So basically what this passage teaches is kind of a progression of our sin. But what he does is he starts off by saying, God is not the one who tempts you. So never put this in God's court like, God, you allowed this to come into my life and you were tempting me with this. God is not the one who tempts. But the temptation is fueled by our desires, by, or in other words, the flesh. So the temptation is fueled by the desires that we have. So here's what happens. In, in Thomas Brooks' book, he describes this in a very easy way for us to visualize it. Basically, he says this, we're like fish desiring food, okay? A fish swims around the ocean, right? What their whole life revolves around swimming around the ocean looking for food, right? And if you're a fisherman, what do you do? If you're a fisherman, you find good bait to get the fish you want. So you put bait, and where do you put it? Do you just put it on a string? No, you put it on a hook. So when that fish bites the hook, guess what? This innocent little fish is swimming around the ocean, right? And you want dinner and you just throw that nice bait in and they're like, oh, there's food. And they get it, right? And they're caught. They're hooked. That fish did not know what was coming. Well, guess what? We're like the fish. Satan baits the hook with something that we desire. We're tempted. And if we grab hold, we didn't even realize that there was a hook in there. The hook is actually sin. So if we're not on guard, we go for the bait, the hook's in there, hooks us, and guess what? We get caught in sin. And some of you know that feeling. I'm sure all of you know that feeling. Now I'm caught in sin. I'm caught, and I'm dealing with everything this sin has offered me. The problem is this. We thought that it was going to be good, but Satan behind it was like, yep, that's how it works. You thought it was going to be good. You thought it was going to bring fulfillment, and you're hooked. Now you're hooked. Maybe you're hooked into something. So what I want to do now is I want to look at some common areas of temptation. The world, the devil, and the flesh sometimes work in unison against us to catch us in sin. Now, I could do a sermon or two on each of these. Maybe in the future I will. But today I'm just going to scratch the surface. And I'll just say, uh, some of these topics will make you very uncomfortable. I know for myself, being the one who has to talk about it, I'm very uncomfortable up here. So I'll probably use some humor, maybe, okay? And uh, just to make myself a little bit more comfortable. And I'll just tell you, some of these things I don't really feel like talking about on a Sunday morning. But I have to, okay? Because... These are common areas. It's not every area of temptation, but these are some common ones. The first one, it's kind of easy. Let's start off. Money. Money, we all know. It's not bad. It's a useful tool. It's a necessity in life. But the love of money can cause some serious issues. That's what 1 Timothy says. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Remember that. That's not, some people say, the money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Basically, the allure of money solving problems, the allure of money giving us what we think we want or need can be very strong. This temptation can send people into all kinds of sin. People get greedy. People get dishonest. People ruin relationship. Maybe that's happened in your family. Somebody passes away and there's an inheritance that needs to be split up. And guess what? Nobody's getting together for Christmas this year, right? Because of what? The money, right? We all want the money. Ruin relationships. Sometimes it gets you in trouble with the law. Because of this desire, the desire for money, a useful and good thing, in some ways causes people to wander away from the faith. It just, it messes with them. This money issue. Next, this is where we get awkward, sex, okay? Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Now, sex within the confines of marriage is good. God created that. 
But this world has taken something that God created as good and absolutely perverted it, okay? Now we have a culture that promotes lust, that challenges God's design and tempts people to live outside of this design. Now, some of you here might even think this is like an antiquated message. This is culturally irrelevant to some people. But the truth is, this is God's design for sex. But the world has perverted it and used it to actually tempt you to do things that God says not to. So the Apostle Paul actually teaches about this issue in 1 Corinthians 7. And the question is kind of weird. It's not really a question that many of us would have. The question that Paul got from this Corinthian church was actually about celibacy. Because Paul was celibate, and then they thought it was wrong to be celibate. Because Paul traveled around preaching the gospel, never got married. He was called to be single and actually spend his life serving God. So they had a question, like, Paul... If this is what you're doing, isn't this what we should all be doing? And, and here's how Paul answers. Here's how Paul answers. He says, basically, this is a very specific call for me, but let me just tell you about marriage. He says in this, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality. So right out of the gates, he says, okay, because the temptation to sexual immorality is strong, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. If I just stop there, I'd be like, what? <laughs> okay. Um, but then it says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And some people are like, that's right. Okay. That's right. I agree with that. <laughs> okay. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps for an agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that what Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Married couples, those who aspire to be married, do you see what this is saying? Part of your marital commitment is to help guard your spouse from the temptation of looking elsewhere for their desires to be met and sinning against you, and sinning against God. So part of your marital commitment is to protect your spouse. God gave you one another, and one of the purposes is to meet the intimacy need for one another. If you want more on this topic, you can read chapter 7, okay? And everybody's like, I'm going home reading chapter 7, okay? Here's the thing. We're going to go on to the next one. It's less <laughs> awkward, okay? Okay. <laughs> Common areas of temptation. Rest. Rest is good, right? I got an extra half an hour of sleep last night because we changed the services. So, in fact, God rested after he created to model rest for us. God didn't need to rest. He's God. Okay? But the temptation for some is always rest. Okay? We call this laziness. The Bible refers to this as the sluggard. Okay? The desire of the sluggard kills him for his hand. Hands refuse to work. Now, let me just say this. No one admits they're lazy. No one admits they're lazy. But a good way to find out that you're lazy is ask yourself a few questions. Here's the first question you need to ask yourself. Do people keep saying to me, you're lazy? Okay? <laughs> if that, if, if that, people are saying that, you're probably lazy. Okay? Can I be working but just don't feel like it? If the answer to that is yes, you're probably lazy. Do I have days or weeks in which I get nothing done? If the answer to that is yes, you're probably lazy. Are most of my accomplishments, I binge watch this show, okay? You're probably lazy if the answer to that is yes. Or am I able to, am, am, I, am I not providing for my family, but I seem to have time to hang out with my friends and do leisure activities? Hey, if the answer to any of these is yes, you probably fall into this rest too much or laziness. The next common temptation is food. Okay, food is good, right? We love food. But gluttony is a sin. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's the accepted sin among Christians. In fact, a lot of times we plan events around how much we can eat, right? We get together, potluck, bring, ooh, dessert table. You have a dessert table at home? No, we do here, okay? And, uh, 
So here's the thing. The overindulgence of food is actually called gluttony. If you found honey, what does it say? It doesn't say honey's bad. It says eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill and vomit. So food, this good thing that God created, can be very tempting and cause problems for us. When we overeat, it could cause health problems. It could cause self-esteem problems. It, it, it's an area that some people try to get control of, but they have a problem getting control of, or they go the opposite extreme and they get so controlling, it sends them into an eating disorder. Okay? So food can cause some problems if we mismanage it. We're going to get more into that a little bit later. The next common area of temptation, kind of along with food, substances. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, the first substance, alcohol. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats be bursting with wine. You catch what's happening here? Basically, in this case, God is calling your vats bursting with wine a blessing. Jesus' first miracle on the scene was turning water into wine. Throughout the scriptures, we see feasts and celebration with wine and strong drinks. Scriptures do not condemn the use of alcohol, but it condemns the abuse, which is actually drunkenness. Which then we realize the temptation is this. The use of it can actually lead to the abuse of it. Other substances that are used for good but are abused are medication. 2 Kings 27 says this, Bring a cake of figs and let them take it and lay it on the boil that he may recover. And this is talking about healing Hezekiah. There's plenty of scriptures that talk about using natural resources for healing. It's basically what modern medicine does right now. It uses natural resources for healing. But we obviously realize it creates drugs and medications that, unfortunately... People abuse. So both alcohol and drugs are very addictive. And when someone has victory in that area, recovers in that area, you realize this. There's still a huge temptation for those people because of those substances, because of the addictive nature of that. The final area of temptation is for those of you that we went through this list, and you're like, I'm doing pretty good, okay? I, 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 got, I got all this under control. I'm glad. Well, here's the thing. The last one is pride, okay? Sometimes we can think we're doing so good, and we've conquered and have victory, and now we're prideful. Pride goes before destruction. Some of you have heard it this way. Pride goes before the fall. Accomplishments and victories in the area of sin are great. It's what God desires. But the temptation for us then is to think we're better than other people and to look down on them. So now that we know where temptation comes from and some common areas of temptation, let's get to what we want to learn this Christmas. What we want to learn this Christmas is how to resist temptation. And the first area, and it's going to be the first area in all the how-tos, and that is we need to pray. Jesus says this, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Holy Spirit is willing, willing to help us. I'll tell you this every week if I have to. You can't do it on your own. You need help. So maybe one of those common areas struck a nerve with you, and the first thing you need to do is pray. You need to pray. Maybe there are certain people in your life. Maybe there are certain things in your life that are actually causing or being used to tempt you. You need to pray. Before you leave the house, before your feet hit the floor, you need to pray. Because the flesh is weak. Okay? We're all human. The flesh is weak. And we're all susceptible. So those of you that are prideful, you got to break down that pride and say, you know what? I can make a crucial mistake. I'm not above that at all. Lord, I need help, and your spirit is willing to help me, so I'm calling on you to actually help me. Now, the next three points are all found in 1 Corinthians 10.13, which 1 Corinthians 10.13, when it comes to temptation, is a great memory verse. It's a great one to commit to memory. And it starts off, the first thing is, you need to realize you're not alone. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Let me just tell you, you might have saw that list or thought of some other things, and you might just think, like, I, I, I'm, I'm totally alone. 
No one else is like this. There's something wrong with me. No one else is. Let me just tell you, it's common to people. There's someone else that's struggling. So no temptation has overtaken you. That's not common to man. You're not the only one who struggles. Part of getting to know other believers is finding like-minded people that are willing to encourage, admit that they have similar struggles, pray for one another, and encourage one another. The problem that many of us face is this. We wound up surrounding ourselves with people that are actually sending us down the wrong path. So then we blame them. Oh, if I wasn't with you, or if, if you didn't say this, or you didn't make me... The, the, the truth is, is you have to have balance and surround yourself with like-minded people that don't want to partake in the things that you're trying not to partake in and you're trying not to give into. People that call those things sin and people that don't say things like, it's no big deal. So first is you need to realize you're not alone. Second, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Believe that God is faithful. The only way to really believe that God is faithful is spend time learning his promises. You need to spend time learning his promises. The more you know about his word, the more you realize that he is faithful to what he has promised. But notice it says, beyond your ability. Didn't I just say you can't do it on your own? Well, the truth is this. God is faithful and he prepares you for the things that you are going to walk through. In other words, he is not going to let you go through something that he has not prepared you to go through. So if you're standing on the edge of something and everything's coming your way, even if it's something that, you know, you're not even tempted, maybe it might be a suffering. God has prepared you for this moment so that you can actually go through it. Think about Job, 42 chapters of this man, suffering. God allowed him to go through it. Why? Because God prepared him. God prepared him. He knew that Job had what it took because he was the one who gave it to him. And the final thing from this passage is know that there is a way out. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Don't believe the lie that you're telling yourself or the devil is telling you. You don't, ha you don't have to partake in whatever the temptation is. You can escape. Some people are like, oh, you know, temptation was too great. and I, I, There was no way out. I had to do it. I, I had to go that way. I had to do that thing. No, no, no. There is a way out. If you believe the scriptures are true, God is telling you right here, there is a way out. A great example of this is Old Testament Joseph, okay? Not Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. Old Testament Joseph rose up in ranks in Egypt, second in charge to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife, so the guy in charge, Potiphar's wife seduces Joseph. What does he do? He runs so fast, he leaves his coat in her room, okay? He ran out so fast that he left his coat behind. He knew there was a way out. He knew there was a way out. God provided the way out. Which brings us to the next thing, and that is we need to practice self-control. Titus 2, 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So basically, we see this. It, because of our salvation, it trains us to renounce ungodliness, to live self-controlled. Well, so now, when we think about that, how do we apply this? How do we apply being self-controlled? And some of the ways off the top of my head that I thought of were the first is practice contentment. Be content with what, what you have. Be content with the position that you have. Be content with the stage of life you have. Be content with whatever your finances are. See, what happens is, is a lack of contentment causes there to be something to be tempted by, right? Because Satan's like, oh, look at that. They want more money. Hmm, how am I going to bait the hook here? How can I make them go the wrong way? Oh, they, they have a lust issue. Oh, let me, let me bait that hook with something they're watching or something they're seeing. This is how it works. So when we're not content with where we are in life, 
here's what happens. We're tempted to change it. And oftentimes we're tempted to change it with a sinful response. The other thing is practice moderation. Some things like food, obviously necessary. So you learn that certain things are not bad, but certain things, if we don't moderate, can be very bad. This is why crazy diets never work. You ever, you ever go on a crazy diet and, like, you know, you tell everybody, you know, you're like, I'm not doing this or I'm not eating that. And that lasts how long, right? So people come to me all the time. They're like, I'm not eating sugar anymore. I'm like, yes, you are. Okay, here's the thing. It's not going to last because you can't moderate that. You can't live like that. So you need, to, you need to moderate what you need to, you know, have that moderation and realize, like, okay, like most would say that eating three square meals and exercising is the way to kind of keep healthy. People don't like that because it's long term. They just want a quick fix. Like, I want to lose 20 pounds, so I'm going to, like, starve myself. Okay? That will work. But then guess what? When you decide you need to eat again, it's going to be a problem. So there's moderation. Practice focus. When when your focus is on the right thing, guess what? You get the right outcomes. It's plain and simple. Practice focus. Now, use other areas of self-control as an encouragement that you could have victory in this area of temptation. So look at your life. If you study like leadership and successful people and stuff, they're usually successful in many different areas. It's rare that you have somebody that's like a total mess, but super successful in this area. They usually, it spills over. Dave Ramsey, I've talked about this before. He said, you know, he's the finance guy. And he says he'll get letters from people saying things like, oh, I got my finances under control. Now I'm losing weight. And he's like, okay. But the truth is, is they see where they have victory in one area, and then they apply those principles to those other areas. Finally, how to resist temptation, and nobody likes this one, and it's this. Take drastic measures. Matthew 5, Jesus says this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members then your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, let me just clarify here. Jesus is not teaching dismember yourself, okay? He's not teaching that. But what he is teaching is that sometimes you need to take drastic measures to keep from sinning. Let's think about the common areas. Apply some of this. The common areas that we learned about. If your issue is money, maybe you have to stop using credit cards. You're like, well, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, you can't stop using. Well, maybe you need to because you can't keep up, right? If your issue is lust, maybe you have to get rid of your smartphone. Well, that's crazy. Do you know they still make flip phones? Maybe you need one, okay? Maybe you need one. That's drastic. Everybody's going to make fun of you, okay? But here's the thing. I might even too. Um, No, Uh, I wouldn't. (laughs) Here's the thing. You take drastic measures to keep yourself from looking at something inappropriate. If your issue is gluttony, maybe you need to change your eating habits. If your issue is alcohol, maybe you can't even drink one drink. Because you know one drink leads to five, leads to ten. I remember talking to a gentleman some years ago before uh, the holiday season. And he said, oh, pray for me. I'm a recovering alcoholic. And the holidays are brutal. Because everywhere he goes, right? So he's like, I I, I can't. Like, I got to stay away from that stuff. Maybe your issue is laziness. Maybe you need to make a consistent schedule for yourself so you actually can accomplish Or maybe your issue is pride. Maybe you better realize that, you know what? I could fall at any time. I could fall at any time. Let me just tell you something about drastic measures. And hopefully this will wake you up. Drastic measures seem crazy, but if you don't take drastic measures, the consequence of your sin may deal out some serious drastic measures. You may embarrass your family. You may ruin your marriage. You may come to financial ruin. You might go to jail. You may create health problems. You may end up addicted. 
The temptation of that sin will not deliver what you thought it would. Satan is lying to you. He's making you think that partaking in that will fulfill some kind of void or some kind of need, but he's a liar. And he's lying and baiting that hook so you get caught and then you displease God, you sin against God, but you throw literally a grenade at your entire life because of this momentary pleasure that you were seeking after. This is why I think there's such benefit in reading books and watching TV and movies. Because guess what? We put ourselves in the place of the main character, right? And when they do stupid things, we're like, that was stupid. I wouldn't do that. But then we don't step back and say, I'm the main character right now. Should I make this decision or that decision? Let me roll back and play out how both decisions are going to go. If you don't take drastic measures in your life, drastic measures will come your way when you sin. Just that's the truth. See, Jesus resisted the devil's temptations because he knew the Father had a better plan. Remember the temptations of Jesus? One of them was like, I'll give you this whole kingdom. The devil will give you this whole kingdom. And Jesus had the whole kingdom, was getting the whole kingdom, but he knew he had to go to the cross. So that was kind of not a great plan for Jesus, right, to suffer on the cross. But he knew that was the plan. He knew the Father had a better plan. God has a better plan for you. He has a better plan for you. He doesn't want you to partake in that sin. Now, after hearing all this, some of you may be in a situation where you already sinned. You're looking at what we just learned and you're thinking, I really wish I would have known this. I wish I would have practiced this. I wish I would have taken heed. You feel guilty. Maybe you're ashamed. Maybe you're reaping the hard consequences, the drastic measures. What now? Well, here's the thing. I don't want you to leave here feeling guilty. I don't want you to leave here feeling guilty because look at what God says. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So he's saying, hey, listen, I don't want you to go down this road, but if anyone does sin, look at this next. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation, meaning the payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. I don't want you to leave here guilty because you don't have to. Okay, because you can be and you are forgiven in Christ. See, Christ died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Three days later, he rose from the grave to prove that he is God. The scriptures tell us this, all who believe will have eternal life. If, you, if you're in a situation where you're feeling guilty about your sin, give that to Jesus. He wants to forgive you. I don't want you leaving here feeling guilty. I want you leaving here knowing that you're forgiven. That's why we celebrate communion, right? That's why we observe communion. Because Jesus died for us. He laid down his life. His body was broken. His blood was shed for my sin and for yours. The sins of the world for all of us. He's saying, here's the gift. Take it. But maybe you're struggling. Another thing that we do during communion, so we remember what Jesus has done for us. But during communion, we actually evaluate our own life. Maybe there's something going on right now. Maybe it wasn't one of these common areas. It's something different that you're just struggling with. The temptation is great. You can't seem to find that way out. You can't seem to believe right now that God is faithful. Something's going on, and you're just kind of a mess. And maybe you haven't told anybody about it. Maybe you haven't talked to anybody about it. Maybe you haven't went and and said, like, this is what I'm struggling with because you're ashamed and embarrassed about it. Well, guess what? It's common. We learned that, right? It's common. Maybe you just need help with some area of life. Communion is a good time to really evaluate that. Lay it at the feet of Christ and and ask him for some guidance on what to do from here. If you hold on to that on your own and don't give it to him, you're going to continue in those problems. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you just a few minutes of silence I just pray to God, ask him for help, and then we'll partake together.